Hello and welcome to another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. I'm Dino Varelli, founder and CEO of Project Purple. And we have another interview for you coming up with a very special guest after a few quick updates. We are rocking into 2023. We're already six months into 2023, which is just so wild because the last six months have been unbelievable for us from our New York City half to uh, our Chicago spring half marathon. We just came off our third annual charity golf classic, which was our biggest golf outing ever. If I sound tired today, I am a little uh, worn out from our golf outing yesterday, but what a great event. And we have so many virtual events happening. We have our work harder later in the summer, but we have so many great opportunities to get involved here at Project Purple, whether it's our virtual events, our 5Ks, our marathon program, our golf outing, which happens once a year. And we also are going to be launching urban repelling events in Hartford, Connecticut in September. To learn about all these great things, please visit our website at projectpurple.org and make sure to follow us wherever you are on social media to stay up to date on all things Project Purple. Without further ado, let's meet our special guest today who's been on the podcast before. We were trying to play, we are trying to figure out how many times. I think this is number four, but coming to us all the way, I believe from Rhode Island, uh, where she spends most of her time national record holder. Your resume is so long. I know I know you've been on the podcast multiple times, uh, but I like to say new mom. I say new, which is an amazing accomplishment. Um, former guest, Project Purple ambassador, um, the great, the wonderful Molly Huddle. Thank you for joining us once again on the Project Purple podcast. Yeah. Hi, Dino. Always great to catch up and see what you guys are up to. So many new creative things. So... Uh, you have a lot of energy. You have as much energy as Jojo does when it comes to <laughs> getting this done. <laughs> Molly, I'm, 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 I had a, a huge glass of coffee this morning. Uh, I think I got like five hours of sleep last night and uh, Sunday night wasn't any better as we were preparing for our annual charity golf classic yesterday. Beautiful day in Norwalk. Um, we had over 120 golfers. It was sold out and just the weather really cooperated. You know, it's kind of like and I know you can relate to this. It's like like that marathon pre you know process where you start to look at the weather and you start to stress about the weather, and that's how it was for the golf outing because it's an outdoor event and we're like, mm-hmm. oh my god, is it going to rain? Is it going to be bad? And it was beautiful. It was very windy um, w- in the beginning, which was uh, which was okay. It wasn't rain. It wasn't snow. But you know, it's that stress of the weather that we you know I thought we would get away not running marathons, but <laughs> we still have putting on golf outings, but it was a great day and a great event. You've been up to a lot. And uh, we were we were talking before we hit record, uh, just catching up, because I know it's been a while that you and I have talked, um, but a lot's changed. So I, I kind of, you know, when I reached out to you, I was like, oh, this is a great opportunity. You know, uh, you mentioned JoJo, you and your husband, Kurt, became parents, and now you're getting back in the training. You've written a book. Uh, you ha- have launched a successful podcast that I think you still do. Um, so like, there's so much going on. Cause I think the now, you know, as we talk through this, now my memory, the brain starting to work here. Um, you were just, I think the last time we spoke, you had just launched the podcast and I don't think the book was out just then. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. We launched the podcast in at the world championships in 2019. That was our first episode. So, wow, it was that long ago we, we last talked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. So so let, let's talk a little bit about some things here. So let's talk about, um, first, I think the most important thing, becoming a mom and, and having Joe. So I know that like impact, I, and you're awesome. For, for people that don't follow Molly, please go out and follow Molly because I think you keep it as real as possible. I love your content. Uh, By the way, do you do all your own content? Yes, I do. My husband will tell you. (laughs) He's always like, what do you like? Can you put your phone down? But I do try and keep it segmented into like certain parts of certain weeks. So yeah, um, yeah, that's why some of the photos are blurry and (laughs) not the best lighting. (laughs) <laughs> but Molly, I love that because that is real though. And, yeah. and, but, but on a serious note, like you keep it very real. I, I think you're very 
genuine person. You and I have met in person. I've gotten to know you over the years. You you keep it pretty real on social. There's, I, you know, and I think that's the one thing for, I mean, there's good and bads, right? And I always try to find in social media, I try to find the goods in it um, in the sense. And I, I think, you know, for a lot of, you know, young women, whether they're uh, competitive athletes or also, um, you know, your weekend warriors, I, I think you, you are a voice in the community and there's a bunch of others that keep it real. Um, because I think that's, but that's important, especially in today's day and age. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think the content that you put out is awesome. I know you've talked about, you know, from, you know, as I was mentioning, you know, becoming a mom, like you were training, you were still putting in some, some decent mileage. Um, and then you were doing a lot of cross training as kind of as the pregnancy wore on, because it's just not probably healthy to, to run the mileage that you were running or that you were used to being a professional athlete. I mean, I was, and I was trying to document it as much as I could on Instagram, not so much to tell people this is what you should or shouldn't do, but just because there is so little information out there about it. And I remember asking like my doctor and I don't think she understood what professional sports like entailed. So there is just so many gaps in the research and what you can and can't do. And we're all just on the elite side, like DMing each other, asking like, what did you do when you were pregnant? Did you run this much? Could you do this workout? And so it's kind of crazy that that's the level of information we're working with (laughs) around uh, women's health research and um, maternal health and research around like the intersection between sport and, you know, pregnancy. So, yes, it's a niche field, but um, one that, you know, still has a lot of a lot of room to grow. So I just was figuring other women are going to be having babies, but they're probably going to be wondering how to train through and. I took a pretty conservative approach, my conservative approach with it myself. I mean, you definitely could uh, do it a variety of different ways, but I got such a big response from, you know, lots of different women, women who, um, you know, run marathons and have goals there for like qualifying for the Olympic trials, women who are just um, working and running for fun, competing for fun, you know, women I ran in on the teams with in high school and college reached out. So yeah, it was definitely like resonating. <laughs> well, I think to your point, and you just said something so powerful. It's like, there's, there's really not a, in, you know, to relate it to what we do here. Like, I, I think it, it's frustrating from a patient advocate because like, there's no book on how to treat pancreatic cancer, like how people should do. And similar to your point, like that's going to be extremely frustrating. Like, you know, you're going through this process that million of wom- millions of women do every day, right? Like childbirth, it's a very natural process, but very niche in the sense like for professional athletes. And, and I know, and we're, we'll probably talk about this, you know, being very vocal um, that you've been vocal in the sense that, you know, women athletes don't always get the same treatment as male athletes but perform at a higher level or at that same level right and and we can look at all the sports but then you think about it okay so just because a woman athlete gets pregnant like how come there's not any information there like what should we be doing you know and you know it's it's almost not fair that there's not any information out there and that you kind of had to go out on your own so i know you mentioned friends and maybe knowing have you thought about in this process of putting out a book maybe oh there's a lot of women (laughs) yeah there's there's quite a there's um maybe two women at least that i've heard of who wanted to put out a book and i hope they hope they do it i hope they get there if they don't do it i guess i could try and do it Um, (laughs) add something else to your plate definitely a need for that and also just like filling in the gaps in research so it's like a lot of things on the side of um you know health there's a lot of just general general research, general medical research is often done only on uh, male or highly male um, subjects. Same with sports research, just because, you know, when you're controlling for variables, the female like hormonal milieu is seen as too many variables, but then you just don't have enough women in the research and then that could affect things downstream. So sports exercise research is no different. And then that would exclude like all of um, maternity and post baby comeback stuff. So there's just a big gap there. Um, and yeah, a book or like five are needed. <laughs> I would. Say. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't disagree. 
it, it's fascinating too, Molly. And I know we, we we mentioned, and we don't have to mention names, but I mean, I think anyone who who knows, or if you don't know, just go out and Google. There's been like this crazy baby boom within high level professional mm -hmm. women marathoners and track athletes, which is just awesome to see. And I don't, do you, well, let me ask this question. Do you think because social media, the rise of, you know, information could be the reason, or is it maybe that we now have come to this crossroads where this has become acceptable? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of crazy too to think, right? Like, like how was this not acceptable twenty years ago? Mm -hmm. You know, I definitely think, yeah, there's a lot more women seeing how they will be supported through this, but by you know, not easy means. I'm sure, like the Dream Crazy um, op-ed that came out that Alicia Montano and Lindsay Krause put together, like moved a lot of mountains as far as like contracts go in the women's pro sports world. So, like. I don't know how it worked for like leagues and um, teams that have like uh, players unions and stuff, but in Olympic sports, you're usually just reliant on like sponsor contracts. And so a lot of those are just, you're an independent contractor and they wouldn't have any clause in there that would, should you get pregnant would protect you for that amount of time. Usually your pay just would get cut. So those were restructured. And I think that made the biggest difference. And then you see the yeah. first few women take advantage. Like I'm the first woman that ever used our re new restructured contract at Saucony to go on supported like maternity leave. It's like, that's how new these are. So then other women are seeing that and saying like, oh, well, I never considered I could like run until I'm 40. More women are doing that now, like running at a high level for a long yeah. time. And they're saying I never considered like picking my spot when I have my kids. I always just was waiting for an injury or waiting to be almost done, um, which is what I did basically because that contract didn't get changed until pretty late. But I think that's more what's behind it, like the support. Because um, without support, you're, I mean, it's already scary stepping away from the sport that long because all you know, your progress is, you know, it's your body. Like you really just can't yeah. compete at a high level until a certain number of months afterwards. So um but then knowing you're supported by your sponsors still, it just makes a big difference. So I think that's behind it. But now it's opening all these other um, needs as far as like, well, how do you safely train during pregnancy at a high level? How fast do you come back? Like what's recommended and all these other questions and how do we best support the moms, you know, from the federation level? Like that's something I'm kind of thinking about now myself, having gone through a bone stress injury, like 10 months postpartum. And talking to some other moms who at a really high level of competition, like also had a bone injury around that like one year mark. Um, so I'm trying to like see, okay, how can we reach out to these women? Who so kind of working on that now that I've been through it and I can like see what's needed. Um, and hopefully we can kind of get things rolled out. And then of course, supporting Alicia at Ann Mother with all her uh, initiatives. Um, she's already done so much. So I was kind of like, use me however you can. Like, how can I help you? I'm doing some research already with like the bone health stuff. Like, can I, you know, can I help you with your educational rollout that you're doing? So yeah, this has been very perspective changing for me. And um, hopefully like I can make it smoother for the people that are coming next and have, you know, want to dive into it again and make those teams and, um, you know, they don't, they don't want to be, uh, kind of making the same, I don't want to say mistakes, but like give, give them more information. Well, it's crazy. And, and you've been, gen and it's crazy in the sense, like hearing you say all this, you've been very generous with working with us, which I've always said, and I know you, you know, you have a personal connection to the disease, um, but you don't have to, right? And I've said this to you off camera, um, but it's just crazy to hear you speak. And, and, you know, again, you're doing this, yes, for you and, and you know, but, what you just said for the next elite runner that potentially will have to make those decisions. It's crazy to me to hear you say, well, this wasn't done before mm -hmm. that here we are in 2023. Think about the runners. You know, I think back to like Paula Radcliffe, you know, when she had her amazing run, you know, like, so thinking about this, She's just the first person that comes to mind because I was just at London and, you know, with, with everything. And, you know, she was just, you know, being from the UK, she's just like, you know, an icon there for women's running and just thinking like, wow, so she didn't have any of that stuff. Like, it's so crazy. 
Yeah. And I, I'd be interested to talk to her about that because I suppose if you're big enough, maybe, um, or maybe not, I don't know. I mean, Alison Felix ran into the same problem, so maybe yeah. not, but, um, yeah, it, it's interesting to know, like, did it depend on relationships or I don't know the, but I do know the general rule was like, Oh, this, and that's what the companies would, would use to kind of keep it that way too. It's like, this is how it's done. Like, um, like I joked on an earlier podcast, asking for a maternity protection was like asking for a Ferrari. Like they'd be like, that's silly. But then like, I thought about it and like, I know some of the guys got like nice cars for their (laughs) bonuses. And I was like, actually they did get the car. We didn't get the maternity protection. Um, but yeah, uh, Paula was a great resource. You know, she got a bone stress injury after one of her babies and, um, she came back so well to win the New York city marathon after, Isla. And so it was interesting. Like when we talked to her for our book, she talked all about like the things that happened and her return to run after having the, her first baby. And so, um, yeah, I was taking notes myself. So that was really helpful. Hearing you just give that analogy, the car, uh, my wife and I just watched that movie on, uh, I think it's on prime air about Michael Jordan and, you know, and the mom asked for ownership, you know, she asked for, and I remember the scene and, and, you know, I think it was, uh, Ben Affleck, who was playing uh, Phil Knight, and he's like, no one's ever asked us that, <laughs> you know, to have like a, a percentage of the sales. And it's almost like, but they wanted the Mercedes, like the, it, it, I'm, I guess I'm giving away the movie a little bit. <laughs> uh, but, you know, Jordan's mom, you know, there were two things they wanted. Uh, well, the agent, David Falk said, Jordan wants a red Mercedes. And he got the red Mercedes, but the mom really wanted, they wanted a percentage of every Air Jordan sold. And until that time, like no one had ever asked for that. And now you think about like all these big sneaker contracts with some of the, you know, d- the signature shoes, especially for the players in the NBA, you know, they get a portion of, you know, each sale, I guess. Um, but till that point, no one had ever asked that. So it's just kind of crazy to your point, you know, no one's ever at, like people have asked for it, but they scoffed at it. Right. But they're giving away cars. So mm-hmm. it, it's like, you're the pioneer in this and you know, what, what that leads to, it's be interesting, you know, 20 years from now to see, like, maybe that changes some people's decision in, in creating a family, right? Maybe mm-hmm. starting earlier or, or, you know, just focusing on that first early on, or, you know, not waiting till like to you said to in the past where like, oh, you had an injury or, you know, you, you, you kind of have to, you know, be on the sidelines because of injuries to start a family. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. And um, yeah, someone has to be the game changer. Right. So that was that was Alicia. Basically, (laughs) she really got a lot done with the contracts. And um, I'm not going to lie, I probably wouldn't have had Jojo, you know, until later, because it just is hard to run and travel and do all the things. But like someone might want to do that. Someone may say, you know, I don't have a problem taking a year off as a healthy athlete to start my family. It's just it was never an option. So it's kind of mind bending to be like, wait, we have that option, you know, more or less now to do that. So it it does, it opens things up. What is the hardest thing of being a mom that you realize given your circumstance? Um, And what I mean by that is like, you know, being a professional athlete, like what's been the hardest thing for you? I think probably just I don't really like recover anymore, which every <laughs> new parent knows, you know, like you don't sleep, you don't really rest, you're always following the baby around and um it's hard to um like get meals in like of the quality, like you're usually just stuffing whatever into your mouth. So like probably the recovery piece, which I'm just kind of in denial about it. And then when I got injured, I was like, maybe all those things just got me, you know, like just not quite enough recovery. Um so Yeah, I'd say that has been the biggest, probably the biggest adjustment. And just, I guess this kind of goes along with it, the time, you know, so like, we do have a part time nanny, so I can at least train, but it's still hard to fit in things like the physical therapy appointments and PT appointments, like I used to massage appointments. Um, Pretty much, I just do like the essentials for now while she's a baby. Um, This is because it's just such a high needs phase, you know, you're just kind of like, I really don't have time for much else in the first year. So that was crazy. But she's starting to get a little more, you know, she can walk. She's easier to, um, like, with the babysitters and stuff. And our nanny, she's easier to, like, 
go occupy herself. Yeah. Not as needy with like the breastfeeding and stuff. She's weaning off that. So it's getting easier. But yeah, the first year, it's just a lot. It's just intense. <laughs> and especially for, you know, when you're training, you're so routine, right? Like in your routine, you're, you're running at certain hours, you're doing certain workouts, you're recovering with certain modalities and you're doing things so routine. When you have a kid, it's like, hey, it's there, it's there mm-hmm. on the clock, right? Like yeah. they're dictating for sure all like, those things. Their routine dominates. And <laughs> it's like I left a track when we were in Arizona, I like left a track workout. I did I did like my warm up and my first I might have done my first rep. And Kurt had Joe at the track and he was timing some of his other athletes. And we tried to like stretch her nap window and it wasn't working and she was cranky like and it was so bright out she wasn't going to fall asleep at the track and I was just like I was like I'll just do this workout another time and I just took her and went home and put her down and I was like old me would have never have never. like thought of doing that but I like I don't want to miss her nap I'll redo my workout later so yeah her schedule it it is more important <laughs> that's uh that's being a mom. Yep. You're, you're on the go. You're on the like, go. It's just how it is. <laughs> and do I did you... get the workout in later if anyone wants. <laughs> <laughs> you it still happens. got it in. Don't I worry. I love it. I love it. Um, my last question here on, on being a mom, uh, and this is kind of a loaded question. Uh, do you think Joe will be a runner? I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to see. You know, I think she's actually going to be tall. And uh-huh. so I was like, oh, maybe we get to have like a basketball player. Well, I know. Yeah, like basketball. That was your that was <laughs> yeah. your first sport, Molly, yes. right? Like I, for like, our I listeners. Would love to, like play some ball with JoJo, but we'll let her decide what she wants to do. But I think she might be, yeah, she kind of has Kurt's like long legs already. <laughs> wow. Well, you still have game because I, I can embarrass you here a little bit. I remember a couple years back, like Saucony did some summit up in like New Hampshire or Vermont or something. It was like in the woods and there was like a knockout game. And I think you won the knockout tournament for all the professional Saucony athletes, right? <laughs> or you were, you were pretty good. I saw you were in like the finals or something. I was in the finals. Yeah. I yeah, couldn't quite yeah. win. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you still got game because you probably haven't, you probably haven't played competitive since like, and you were a very good high school basketball player. I know I was way better at like knockout and like dribbling drills than I was at actual game game environments. Game environments, like I got too nervous, but um, I was really good at like ball handling and all the tricks. Love it. <laughs> all love the useless it. things. <laughs> those are not useless. Those are like you know the, those fun. little details. <laughs> you know, if you can't dribble, then you're you're you know you're yeah. in trouble. So you've also been busy writing. So let's talk a little bit about your book. And I know um, you have a partner with that. Like you guys put the book out and it's been a huge success. Where did the inspiration come from that? And, and let's talk a little bit about that here. Yeah, Sarah Slattery, uh, my co-author, um, we wrote that during COVID actually. And she came up with the idea right before COVID hit. Um, I was down in Arizona for the marathon trials, like training, and she lives there. And we've raced together many times. We're good friends. And she was saying like, we should put together a book that is sort of geared towards um, sort of that like middle school, high school aged female athlete who, um, you know, there's just a lot of ways women, like women and girls are done a disservice in the sport as far as like not enough information around like um, low energy availability and, um, you know, coaching at too high, too intense of a level and like not really accounting for that slump that can happen and puberty for girls. So just all this, in, you know, nutritional information that isn't really given to them early enough. And then they may have bone stress injuries all through their college career because they didn't have this information when they were like laying down bone as 15 year olds, 16 year olds, like all, most of your bone is laid down and up to your 18th birthday. So like all this stuff is really important if you want to be a good athlete later, or just even if you want to like be a healthy body competing and having fun with the sport all throughout your life. Um, so we kind of want to tackle that issue because it, it kept coming up. You know, we kept seeing Sarah as a college coach and I'm an athlete and I often come to speak at that Foot Locker Championship um, race. And Sarah has coached, you know, coached kids that ran through there. We both ran through it ourselves. And you see athletes who are just phenomenal in high school. And on the women's side, they often disappear because, um, or they don't like maximize their potential later because of these things. So it was something we just like, didn't like seeing. And we wanted to write this kind of advice book. And the other half of the book is like motivational stories from, um, 
like professional women from all around the world, distance runners. And so um, we did a bunch of interviews during COVID via Zoom. It was really convenient that like everyone was home and available to us <laughs> because it was COVID. And yeah, um, it's like the one good thing about COVID. Um, so I think it really helped that project take off. And then we edited it uh, 2021, um, that whole year. And then it came out in March of 2022. So now that you've got one under your your belt, as they say, are you guys possibly working on a second book or another topics or? Um, we are at the moment. Like I, I think back to like if I had Joe when I was writing it. Like I don't know if we would have hit our, <laughs> our deadline. Um, yeah. I was really pulling. Like there was a couple of days where like all day I would edit the book. And so I'm glad it came out when it did. I don't know if we'll have time in the next year, but I would love to write another book sometime. Well, it's so awesome. And, you know, um, as I said before, you know, you've really taken a stand on some, some really important topics, as you mentioned before, you know, just being a professional athlete and, you know, being pregnant and how to handle that and what to do. Um, you know, the topics of, you know, I know you've been very vocal about equal pay, um, you know, for women athletes. And I know we were talking before, you know, there's been this amazing run of, women long distance runners here in the United States, even, I mean, globally as well, but like, especially here in the United States, like we've had, you know, and I know you're friends with many of them, you know, these women just achieve amazing accomplishments on the, on the world marathon stage. And it's just fascinating that I I don't know if like, like clearly people in this space are paying attention, but like, I don't know if enough people are, are seeing this from the outside lens. And and I like I'll I'll share a story. Um, and I don't know you you probably know her Tatiana right McFad uh, mm-hmm. Mc, uh, McFadden I think yeah. no yeah. When I started Project Purple, like she was winning, like there was this range in between, like she was so dominant in you know the hand side, you know in that that mm-hmm. um, the wheelchair marathoning, and I don't know if anyone was paying attention during that time frame like how dominant she was mm-hmm. and 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 she even did the winter olympics too like she's yeah. such a sport she's amazing <laughs> yeah just an amazing and if you know her backstory right like she was adopted and you know like she was in an orphanage and and you know and all that stuff it's just wild and like i remember during that span it was probably like i forget the time frame but she won like i think she did like six in a row or something crazy like that right like that that world major like sweep and she was so dominant and i was just thinking at that time i'm like is anyone even seeing this like it's Mm -hmm. it's so cool that like you know the people in the space are seeing it happen but i wonder you know if the outside people are really seeing it um and it's kind of like how i feel right now with with some of you know these women american women marathoners and and middle distance runners and even some of our track and field athletes are just like putting up these these amazing feats in terms of competing at these races and it's just wild that um i know we said before we hit record like if that was happening in the men's side like these athletes would be making a lot of money mm-hmm. and not that money drives it but like let's be honest I, I think like as a professional athlete clearly that you know how much your winnings are where you place in races will equal like how much money you're making and that brings in sponsorship dollars and all the other stuff that comes with that the ferraris um that you know it's just it's just fascinating to me like how how from an outsider's perspective like i don't see that happening in women's sports and i don't know why Mm -hmm. yeah i feel like it's tough because in track and field we don't really know how much each athlete is making just because there's none um you know, you can't talk about it. There's clauses in the contract. Yeah. So I do think that would be really illuminating. Like <laughs> there's some, there's some high paid women for sure. I'm sure. But, um, it would be really interesting to see everyone's like, is there a gender disparity? Like we don't actually yeah. know. Um, but as far as media coverage, we do know there's a gender disparity and luckily track and field and marathoning as well. Generally it's, um, you know, the men and women compete at the same time. So it's like pretty equal ish. Although like I tried to watch the Tokyo marathon when my friends are running it and they don't show the women at all. No. <laughs> so definitely the, the, the sports media side of it, um, is not, balanced and from that is marketability is like determined and so that is hurting the sport but i mean i do think like women's sports 
is having a moment. You know, our book got picked up yeah. really easily when we were shopping it around. And so did quite a few other women's sports memoirs. And so that's a good sign. They're selling really well. Like Lauren Fleshman and Des were on the New York Times best yep. sellers list. Um, so these are all good signs. Um, so it's on an upswing. But yeah, definitely has a ways, a ways to go because I think that stat um, from Professor Cookie at the uh, Minnesota Institute that studies um this stuff is like not it was four percent of all sports coverage in the u.s is dedicated to women's sport and it's not much higher like it hasn't gone much higher like i don't think we're into like 10 percent yet so, so that, and that was from quite a few years ago so we, we definitely have a ways to go um track is kind of its own thing but it still plays by the rules of you know all the sports dynamics too and um the people making the decisions at the top are mostly men so it's like all shaped uh, a certain way. So de definitely a ways to go, but yeah, we have great athletes and we're getting, we're getting even better athletes. It just seems like these NCAA women and the college girls are, or the high school girls, like these athletes are running faster and faster. All the records are being broken. Um, so they'll be, you know, as good as we are now, it's going to get better. <laughs> true. True. And, and on that note, and this is a good segue here. Is it, inspiring to see like women like Sarah and some of these other um and I'm not trying to be disrespectful but they're 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 not in their 20s they're older and we're seeing women at an older age typically running at a very high level and yeah. with and with moms right yes. we're seeing moms running yeah. at, at a very high level as well yes yeah that definitely inspires me um you know like there's a lot of examples of that when you really look like Edna Kiplagat was won the Boston Marathon, yeah. you know, when they adjusted it last year. Um, she's 41, was 41 yeah. last year, I think. Yeah, 41, yeah. yeah. Um, there's an Australian runner, Sinead Divers. She set the, the record, Australian record. She went in 221 at age 45, I think. Wow. And, you know, everyone's different. I mean, I definitely feel more beat up now and get more <laughs> injuries now than I did when I was younger. But the marathon seems like the event where this stuff is possible. Yeah. Um, so maybe your endurance uh, doesn't go away as quickly as other stuff does. So I'm kind of holding on to that. And, um, yeah, definitely inspired by those women. You know, our marathon team could be, um, you know, for the Olympics could be like three women over 35. So that's very realistic. So it's pretty crazy. It's so awesome. And it's interesting. You said there is kind of, I feel like there is a little bit of a surge in the youth, but you know, that always kind of plays out at that marathon level. Clearly, you mm -hmm. know, we typically don't see runners come out of college and then jump. Like I know the, the two E girls like breaking every collegiate <laughs> record, it seems like, yeah. <laughs> but I, maybe we won't see her in a marathon, you know, for the next, I don't know, five or 10 years, potentially who knows, you know, I mean, I think it's a hard jump to go from, you know, a 5,000, you know, meter race to a, a half marathon, even in, in, a, in a short period of time, I think that would be pretty aggressive, I guess. Yeah. And she's got some crazy PRs to set in the five and 10. So you wouldn't want to yeah. leave those on the table. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's fun to watch. Um, I got a, I got a couple questions here. Uh, I know with your podcast and, and I know, I think we asked you this last time, um, three guests that you'd love to interview. I know things have changed a bit now being a mom coming through this injury, who would be your three guests? Has that changed a bit? Or who are those? Like, if you could pick anyone in the world to come on and, and interview, who would those be? Um, well, there's, I can give you the list of women I keep like badgering, but I can't get through it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we might be able to help you there. So, so uh, Allison Felix, who I know, I, I think Alicia um, has worked with uh, Allison and her brother before. It's just the time schedule. She's a very in demand yeah. woman. I'd love to talk to Allison. Um, I'd love to talk to Offing Mo. She doesn't really seem to do a ton of podcasts and interviews. I'd love to talk to Valerie Adams. She retired a few years ago. She's a thrower from New Zealand and she's just like such a legend, just like, like very consistent champion. Um, you know, she's just an amazing athlete. Um, and like, always seemed like, and she's had, she had her two babies as well. And I think came back to competition after first one. So I'd love to talk to her about that. Um, who else did I want to talk to? Oh, Neka Agumike. Of, I probably maybe could talk to Neka. I did meet her once um, at a photo shoot. She's helped um, put through the collective bargaining agreement at the yep. NBA. Yeah. Um, and she's also a player. Um, 
So she's kind of making moves over there, very inspired by her. Um, and yeah, def- I would want to talk to some more of the WNBA ladies because they're just like such stars. <laughs> Who's your favorite WNBA player right now? Probably NECA, just because I'm like, <laughs> I love what she's doing off the court. That's how I am too. I'm like, I love Megan Rapino because of what she does yeah. on the field and off the field. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, big NECA fan. Um, big um, Agun Bawali fan because uh, she went to Notre Dame and she's like such a player. Um, yeah, so. That's awesome. Uh, I tend to go with the Huskies. So because, you know. Connecticut, we have great yep. women's basketball. So I, li- I like those former Husky players. They, they seem to do pretty well in the WNBA. Um, so my last question here, what's the plan here? I know we talked before you're, you're, you know, hopefully injury free or would you be looking to run in the fall? What distance? If you had your, if you had your, and I know it's, this is like a crystal ball here. Like <laughs> if Molly could have her way, all the cards align and you know, everything goes the way it's supposed to go. What, what are you looking at? I would love to run like a flat, flatter, faster fall marathon. If I can get my build up going in time, you know, I'm pretty yep. out of shape. I've got a long way to go. <laughs> Cause this injury required like almost three months off. That's a long time. Oh. Um, but we'll see. Like, like I would hope by October I could try and run. And then, um, after that, pretty much you're building up again for the Olympic trials marathon. So I really would love to fit one in before that. Cause I know the Olympic trials is going to be pretty tactical. It's going to be in Florida, very warm. People are racing for Olympic spots and no one's going to want to do anything too risky. Um, so to get a, to get a PR in would be great. That's kind of what I've been hoping the last I was hoping to do a marathon in May before I got hurt. And that was kind of the goal there. So carrying that over. Awesome. Awesome. And is the ultimate goal to make, uh, hopefully an Olympic team with the marathon distance? That would be great. I mean, we have such a strong group of women, like realistically, you have to be able to run. This is crazy to say, realistically, you have to be able to run under 220 to make our team, you know, cause there's women, those women are capable of that. Kira, Emily, um, Emma, Sarah, like they're all around that time and there could be a wild card in, oh, Betsy Sena, uh, 221, you know, there could be a wild card in there as well. If anyone steps up between now and then. So I got to focus on that low 220 thing first. That's what I want to do in the fall. Yeah. Um, or at least get in that shape by the time the trials come around. So I've yet to run that fast. Would you consider, I know you've, you've had a very accomplished career at like the 10,000 and the, you know, would you go and try to get on the Olympic team that way, possibly? I don't think so because, well, we'd have to see if there were like any, like sort of who was going to run what, see how things mm-hmm. shake out on the track. But I do think I've gotten slower from my like foot injury, but I think I can still do like marathon threshold work. So that's kind of why we're focusing more on that. Um, and I just think it would be hard to run like under 15 minutes again, especially after I've done a couple marathons. So the 5k is out probably out. And then the 10k, I don't know, last year, like, or two years ago, I tried to do some 10k work and it was just like really not coming around, but the marathon Mm. stuff was like, it was, I was hanging in there. So yeah, it would be tougher, I think, to do the 10 and the marathon. So that's kind of what we're focusing on. And I still have like a soft PR in the marathon. So that would feel good to just say like, oh, no matter what, like I ran faster today than I ever have. (laughs) So awesome. Well, I uh, I look forward as as does our community to see you hopefully back in the streets in the fall. I mean, we love when you're in our favorite one of our favorite marathons because we we are in a couple. So I, I can't choose, but I, I am partial to New York City. I know it's yeah. not flat, so <laughs> it's not a flat one, but um, it's always great to see you out there doing what you love doing and and what you're really really good at, Molly. So we can't wait to see. Uh, part three or part four of Molly huddle, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, in the fall, hopefully of, of 2023. And, um, I, I can't wait. Cause it's always great to, you're, you're kind of the consummate competitor. And, and I think, you know, you mentioned Boston and I know you and I have talked about this and this is, uh, the person you are, you, you could have bailed at, at, at a lot of points in that race and you still finished. You still got the finisher's medal. I know it wasn't the result that, you know, you expected that day, but so many elite runners. And that's when for me, and this is Dino Varelli speaking here, whenever I go to these big marathons and I see these elite marathons, like tap out, I think of your story of like, Hey, you could have done that. 
And, you know, a lot of people do. And, and, you know, I'm not saying anything, you know, people who get injured, whatever, but like you gutted it through and that's just the perseverance and your character. And, you know, now you're a mom and, you know, all the things you've done uh, from what you just shared of, of being a professional athlete and trying to figure it out, like, you know, what to do during pregnancy and being a leader for that. And then speaking to the youth, um, you know, with the work with your podcast and the book, it's just so inspiring. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank you for being on the podcast. Um, and I can't wait to see you this fall. Where for our listeners at home is the best place uh, for people to follow? I know you we mentioned social media. I know you're, you're more active on Instagram, though, I think, right? That's really... Yeah, I try to do more updates on Instagram, just at Molly Huddle. Um, I forgot to say the book is called How She Did It. And we have a website if you want to order it on howshediditbook.com. A signed copy can be found there. But otherwise, it's everywhere. Amazon, wherever you get books. Um, and I'm on Twitter, just Molly Huddle. But You're yeah, not on I'm TikTok Instagram. yet? No TikTok No yet? TikTok. I think I downloaded TikTok during the pandemic and then took it off my phone <laughs> right away. I was like, ah, I'm too old for this. Um, <laughs> but yeah, people are going the way of TikTok now. So who knows? Maybe I'll go back on. And um, I think that's pretty keeping track has a, has our blog, uh, keeping yep. track podcast with myself, Alicia Montano and Roshi again talking about more women's sports topics. So lots of places. Awesome. Molly, thanks again for being a guest on the Project Purple. And thanks for all you're doing for women, girls, and for helping us raise awareness in the pancreatic cancer community. Yeah, always. And thank you, Dino, for um, fighting for that as well. I know that's impacted my family and so many others. So keep up the good work. Thank you. That's a wrap of another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. Thank you for listening. Please feel free to follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Till next time, please be safe. Thanks for listening to the Project Purple Podcast.